I can remember uh, standing up in front of our church and saying that I didn't believe in apostolic succession the way that it was taught um, within the Catholic Church, that there were no successors of the apostles in this way. Rather, I taught, well, everybody who's a Christian is a successor of the apostles. We just all have their their same ministry, and so we take up you know, the call to fulfill the Great Commission in that sense. We're the ex- the successors of the of the apostles. So I would have smacked back really hard at the notion that there were particular people who, by virtue of hands being laid on them by successors of the apostles from the earliest days, we still had their ministry among us. <music> Hello and welcome to another Made from Concentrate episode of On the Journey with Matt and Ken and Kenny. Well, it wasn't actually made from concentrate, but I assure you we were concentrating very hard when we made it. I'm Matt Swaim, Director of Outreach here. Ken Hensley and Kenny Burchard were both Protestant pastors. They work in development and pastoral care. And we all ended up in the Catholic Church, and that's the basis of this series that we do called On the Journey. You can find previous episodes by going to CH Network. Dot org. If you want to walk with others who are making these same kinds of journeys and are going through these same kinds of questions, visit our online community. That's community.chnetwork.org. And of course, this is all made possible due to the generous support of our partners and mission. If you want to join them uh, by supporting our work, you can go to chnetwork.org slash donate. Ken and Kenny, how are you? I'm, I'm concentrating. Constantly. I'm concentrating. <laughs> I'm concentrating. Yeah, you, you know what? Yeah, and you, yeah, and you confused me already because you said we were concentrating when we made it. When right now we're making it, we're starting. And yes, I'm but people are watching this in the future. But I'm doing well. So, oh, <laughs> well, that's good. You, you know, you were doing well. That's the that's the thing. What do we mean? Okay. All right. So <laughs> we've been doing a series on the church and what the Catholic church Church says about what the Catholic church is, what the catechism specifically says Mm -hmm. about the nature of the church, ecclesiology as it were. And we've been doing a lot on the four marks of the church. The Nicene Creed lays four of them out. The church is one, holy, Catholic, and apostolic. We did one episode on the idea of the church being one. We did one episode on the church being holy. We did three episodes on what it means to say that the church is Catholic. But now we gotta land the plane and talk about what it means for the church to be apostolic. So, Ken, if you could sort of like build the build the building so we can put the capstone on this thing. As it were. As it were. <laughs> As you said. Yeah. Well, well I'm going to begin to summarize and bring us up to where we're at on the four marks of the church. I'm just going to read paragraphs 866 through 860 nine, the beginning of it, to summarize, because the Catechism summarizes it better than I could. Paragraph 866, the church is one, the first mark. That is, she acknowledges one Lord, confesses one faith, is born of one baptism, forms only one body, is given life by the one spirit for the sake of one hope, at whose fulfillment all divisions will be overcome. Paragraph 867, the church is holy. The most holy God and is her author. Christ, her bridegroom, gave himself up to make her holy. The spirit of holiness gives her life, courses through her veins. Since she still includes sinners, she is the sinless one made up of sinners, the holy church. Her holiness shines in the saints. In Mary, she is already all holy. Paragraph 868, the church is Catholic, summarizing our three episodes, okay? Mm -hmm. She proclaims the fullness of the faith. It's one way in which she's Catholic. She bears in herself and administers the totality of the means of salvation, the sacraments. She is sent out to all peoples. She speaks to all men. She encompasses all times. She is missionary of her very nature. And then finally, in paragraphs 869, The church is apostolic. And since this happens to be our subject for today, rather than reading 
the summary paragraph in the catechism. I'm just going to hand this over to Kenny to launch us on this subject. The church is apostolic. Thank you. Well read, Ken. Well read. Yeah, the church is apostolic. This is the fourth mark of the church. And um, I think a, a great place for us to start this discussion of the word and concept of apostolicity in the church is to do a little on the journey reflection here right out of the gate and talk about whether or not we used that word before we were Catholic and what in the world we would have meant by it. And uh, maybe Matt can go and then Ken and I'll, I'll go last and then I'll jump right in to the paragraphs in the catechism that deal with the church being apostolic. Yeah. And uh, just to summarize, uh, just a couple of quick points in my experience of thinking of the church as apostolic, apostolic would not be a word that would have been very familiar to me in uh, the holiness movement uh, in the world of the Church of the Nazarene or in the Free Methodist Church. If it was rolling around, I didn't pick up on it. Now, uh, when we talk about what the Catholic Church has to say about apostolic and going back to the ancient roots of it, I would have heard the concept of quote unquote old time religion, right? Give me that old time religion. It's good enough for me. It was good for Paul and Silas, you know, and all these all kinds of, th kinds of things. The idea that, you know, somehow, and this wasn't even like a fully formed thought in my mind, but I would have thought, you know, the church started out great and then the Middle Ages got, you know, going and all these like weird things crept up uh, and the Reformation happened and the revival movement really is what happened in the United States to get back to that old time religion. Uh, this is kind of encapsulated in this guy that I used to hear played on secular radio because, you know, sometimes, you know, you can get these radio preachers that buy a time slot at like 5 a.m. on secular radio stations. And there was this guy for years uh, on the same station I used to listen to baseball games on. Uh, his name was Ed Bowsman, and he had God is just a prayer away ministries, and he would preach in this sort of like booming, you know, Southern drawl. And at the end, uh, he would always sign off saying something to the effect of, and I'm not going to quote it exactly, but it was almost exactly like this. He would say, you know, we're preaching the gospel as it was preached in the days of the apostles. Praise the Lord, pass the ammunition. And <laughs> this is how he would end it. But the idea being that... We're preaching it as it was preached in the days of the apostles. Mm -hmm. um, so anything apostolic in my world would have just been like, what do we see the apostles doing in the book of Acts? Let's imitate that. The one other thing that I will say uh, is that in my world, I don't know that I would have understood a clear distinction between apostles and disciples. And there are a number of reasons for that, uh, but one of them has to do with just the way we talked about them. Um, and I do remember when I memorized the 12, as it were, there was a song that we used to sing and the song went, there were 12 disciples. Jesus called to help him, Peter and his brothers, Andrew, James, and John. I would hear, I would have heard them referred to as the 12 disciples, probably more commonly than the 12 apostles. And that brings up a whole other kind of question, but those are some of the things in the background of my experience and my thought as I approach this, this particular word. Well, I, you know, I understand the things you're saying there, and I'll just add this, uh, I guess, one point, really. For me to say that the church was apostolic, and I knew that word when I was a Baptist pastor, um, it would be simply to say that the church was founded by the apostles and founded on the apostles' teaching. And since I viewed the teaching of the apostles as something that could only be known from the pages of the New Testament— at least with certainty, then to say the church was apostolic was really the same thing as, as to say sola scriptura. That's really about it for me. The church is apostolic because it was founded by the apostles, founded upon their teaching, which can be found with certainty only in the New Testament. Right. Yeah, I think I would agree with, with that as being one of the ways I would have used the word apostolic, Ken, for sure. Like I remember teaching through the book of Acts, and when it said they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, I I remember holding up my Bible and said, I said to our church, that's what we do here. We teach what the apostles taught because we teach the Bible. And so in that sense, I would have said um, that the church is apostolic. If you're teaching the Bible, you're apostolic. But I also would have used it in a couple other ways. One would have been uh, that um, it's evangelistic. So if we're going out and leading people to Jesus, then we're kind of following in the footsteps of the apostles and leading people to Christ. Also, in the in the Pentecostal and charismatic circles that I ran in, 
apostolic was also used in two other ways. One would be that if your church had the gifts of the Holy Spirit, like healing and tongues and casting out demons and all that, well, you were doing what the apostles did. So in that sense, you could claim to have this apostolic authority. But also, it's not unusual for people in these Pentecostal and charismatic strands of Protestant evangelicalism to see the gift of apostle, at least as a little a apostle, as being someone who's got, you know, a large measure of authority to oversee other Christians or an entire denomination or a movement. And so having this sort of gravitas and authority, um, there are even now, like you can just Google church leaders who call themselves apostle so-and-so. And and they mean that they have kind of an authority to oversee other groups of Christians and the gifts to back it up. Matt, you, you have another thought there too. I had I have a question for you because you're the uh, you're the Pentecostal in the group. <laughs> uh, would it have been common yeah. for you in your Pentecostal world to have known congregations that were sure. named things like Pine Ridge Apostolic Temple or something like that? Absolutely, and and that, the telegraphing there would be that we have the same gifts and the same authority and preach the same gospel and have all the same theology as the early apostles did. Um, so so within. Pentecostalism, especially the, the the word apostle or apostolic, is used pretty regularly. We're going to find now, as we jump into these paragraphs, that we could have said "Amen" to some of the church things that the church says, the Catholic Church says about apostolicity. But there was one way that I would never have used the word apostle, and we're going to see that as I jump into the, in these paragraphs. So I'm just going to use, I'm just going to read guys 857, uh, which, which really has three little, um, sections there underneath it. So if you have a catechism and you're watching, read along, I'm reading now paragraph 857. It says this, the church is apostolic because she is founded on the apostles. So far, so good <laughs> in three ways. Here they are. First, she was and remains built on the foundation of the apostles, the witnesses chosen and sent on mission by Christ himself. That language is important. She was and remains built on. So this is not a crumbling foundation or a foundation that's passed away. Whatever was built on the apostles is still built on the apostles to this day. And these are specific uh, men chosen, as it says, to be witnesses sent on mission by Christ himself. I could have said amen to that. Second, though, with the help of the Spirit dwelling in her, the church keeps and hands on the teaching, the good deposit, the salutary words she has heard from the apostles. Now, if we were just talking about what's written in the Bible, I would have said amen to this as well. Oh, oh, do you mean the Bible? Yeah. Uh, so I, I can get with that. We're going to find out as we go through this, this um, episode that the church is saying more than that, but not less. And then third, she continues to be taught, sanctified, and guided by the apostles until Christ's return through their successors in pastoral office, the College of Bishops, assisted by priests, in union with the successor of Peter, the church's supreme pastor. And then it ends here with, um, with these words. You are the eternal shepherd who never leaves his flock unattended. Through the apostles, you watch over us and protect us always. You made them shepherds of the flock to share in the work of your son. Now there, I can remember uh, standing up in front of our church and saying that I didn't believe in apostolic succession the way that it was taught um, within the Catholic Church, that there were no successors of the apostles in this way. Rather, I taught, well, everybody who's a Christian is a successor of the apostles. We just all have their, their same ministry, and so we take up 
you know, the call to fulfill the Great Commission in that sense. We're the ex- the successors of the of the apostles. So I would have smacked back really hard at the notion that there were particular people who, by virtue of hands being laid on them by successors of the apostles from the earliest days, we still had their ministry among us. Um, so let me let me pause right there just for interaction and reflection from you guys. I think that Im- embedded in these par- in this paragraph you've read, Kenny, are are really the famous three legged stool of authority within the Catholic Church. Is scripture, tradition, and magisterium are in there. Yeah. And f- yep. for Protestants, I want to comment on the second one, tradition, because for Protestants looking at the Catholic Church, I find that the second leg of the stool, namely apostolic tradition, is often the most confusing and difficult to understand. Although the third one is as well, magisterium, and you're going to go into that more a little bit later on. Um, And and I really understand this. I still feel it because for me as a Baptist, tradition was essentially a bad word. It was an evil word. You know, Jesus had said to the Pharisees, why do you transgress the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? Jesus had quoted Isaiah saying, in vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the precepts of men. That's in Matthew chapter 15, verses 3 and 9. And in my mind, tradition was basically a bad word. And uh, this is what Catholicism was all about, tradition. And in fact, I remember you guys many years ago, maybe a couple of years after I became Catholic, I remember sitting at my kitchen table with an old friend who was a staunch uh, Presbyterian at the time, uh, Protestant. And we, we were having a discussion about this issue of tradition. And so I whipped out, of course, the classic passage, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 15, and I read it to him where St. Paul says, So then, brethren, stand firm and hold to the traditions, Greek word paradosis, it's the word tradition, that evil word, that (laughs) bad word. Paul says, stand firm and hold to the traditions which you were taught by us, either by word of mouth or by letter. And I, I read this to my friend, and in frustration, I remember still so clearly him responding. He said, Hensley, He said, of course, I believe that the oral teaching of the apostles was authoritative. Of course I do. But where is that oral teaching? That was the question he asked. He said, Hensley, can you show it to me? I remember he held up his Bible and he said, look, I can see this. I can can hold the written word of the apostles in my hand. Where are these ambiguous oral traditions that you talk about? Is there a list of them? Can you show it to me? And, and guys, I still fully understand that feeling, the feeling being expressed. In fact, let me illustrate a little bit more. Around the same time, I was listening to a radio debate between a Catholic apologist and a Protestant. And the Catholic in the debate was explaining the same thing. And he said something like this. He said, we can hear the apostles speaking in scripture. This is the Catholic apologist. But we could also hear the apostles speaking in sacred tradition. And again, the Protestant just kind of, he just sort of lost it. And he said, very forcefully, I remember, he said, no, if we had been there at the time, we could have heard the apostles speaking. And if the apostles were here with us now, we could hear the apostles speaking. But unless, Mr. Catholic, unless you're saying that you have some secret recordings of sermons that the apostles gave, and you've got them tucked away in the Vatican or something like that, no. The only way that we can hear the apostles speaking now, he said, is in what they wrote. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm sure you guys can relate. I, yeah. I remember thinking like this myself. And I also, just one more point, and then I, then I want to throw it back for your, you know, I guess, reaction. But I thought like this as well. And I remember the confusion. Well, come on, quit talking about tradition. Where are these traditions? Give me a list. I don't understand what you're talking about. But I also remember the light that came on, really, when I finally understood what the church means when it speaks of tradition. You see, the church doesn't mean, when we use the word sacred tradition, it doesn't mean that along with the writings of the apostles, we also have these cassette tapes, you know, that's, that someone made of, of sermons that the apostle Paul gave, or Matthew, or Mark, or, John, or, or Barnabas, or anybody, or that we have transcriptions 
of sermons that they gave back then that we can use to supplement what's written in the New Testament. That's not what the church means by sacred tradition. What the church means, to put it in its simplest terms, is that the content, the basic content of the apostles' doctrine, what they believed, what they taught, can be known from the faith and practice of the churches they founded. I mean, here's how Vatican II puts this idea. This living transmission accomplished by the Holy Spirit is called tradition, since it is distinct from sacred scripture, though closely connected to it. Through tradition, the church, in her doctrine, in her life, her worship, perpetuates and transmits to every generation all that she herself is, all that she believes. And I, just one more thing. At a certain point, you guys, this just struck me as making sense. It, it made sense to think that what the apostles taught, that the example that they gave, the institutions they established, that they would be reflected in the faith and practice of the churches they founded. Uh, it, it, it simply, I, I turned a corner and it simply made sense to me to think that when I look at the writings of the early church, the early church fathers, and I find them speaking with one voice on subjects like scripture and tradition, the authority of the church, the effects of baptism, the real presence of our Lord in the Eucharist, the Eucharist as a sacrifice, the reality of, of priesthood and altar. It, it makes sense to think that I should be able to trust that this is what the apostles taught them. You guys relate to what I'm saying here? Very much so. Uh, and you know, you've made this point before in our series on Sola Scriptura, which I encourage people to, to go back and watch. Um, you read the letter to the Galatians, and if that's meant to be the only authoritative thing that was supposed to stick with the Galatians is that they shouldn't get caught up on circumcision, uh, and that they should probably like, you know, be into the fruits of the spirit and not the deeds of the flesh. I, and some stuff about Abraham and like his two different kids. And you know, if that's, if that's the substance, the substance of what the church of, in Galatia was supposed to know about the gospel, that's sort of a strange thing, right? Uh, these yeah. are occasional letters. Paul is writing to people who already have the substance of mm -hmm. worship, the substance of the gospel. Uh, because I don't think that in Galatians there is a clear kind of we don't talk about the Galatians road, right? I wouldn't have preached the Galatians <laughs> road to somebody to say, hey, use these five verses in Galatians to lead someone to ask Jesus into their heart. Galatians is kind of a weird letter. Obviously, the substance yeah, of yeah. what Paul had had given to them and or what they had received in the tradition is there. And we're seeing the edges of where it's getting outside of the bounds of what it's substantially supposed to be. And you talked about this, like I say, at length in our series on Sola Scriptura. So there had to be yeah. something that the apostles were giving there, uh, that there's this apostolic thing that exists that we only sort of see by the way that it's leaked out of its proper space. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, so. I, I like that so much, Matt. And and I like what you did there too, Ken, as well. And I what I'll do is hold most of what I want to say here about tradition uh, for when we get down and talk about apostolic succession. But just a to tie in a couple of quick thoughts to what you shared, what you both shared there. One is that I, I, re I relate to the frustration of your friend or the guy that you talked about, Ken, in the debate, because the impulse, the Protestant impulse, especially when informed by something like Sola Scriptura, is to interpret the notion of tradition as a, another thing that's written down over here. So you have the scripture that's written down. And then you have your traditions that are written down. And it isn't that we can't find tradition written down in the writings of the early fathers and the Didache and all the the sermons and commentaries that they that they wrote. We surely can. But remember what you said tradition is, or the word tradition is paradosis. What is that? It's hand to hand or it and, and what ha is happening here is that our ecclesiology is reminding us that the church is embodied. It's an embodied church. It's not a written down church, even though eventually scripture is written down. What's happening is that the message of the gospel 
is going from body to body through the body, and especially a certain set of bodies and a certain set of hands, and those are the apostles and those who they are laying hands on to succeed them. And so when we say tradition, and this is a little bit of a sort of a telegraphing here when we get to apostolic succession, we're not talking about a list of things that's written down. Rather, we're talking about the presence of Jesus embodied in his church and being handed down through his church before scripture is even fully written so that the fullness of the gospel can be experienced, expressed, evangelized, preached, and seen in the world through an embodied church. So this concept of hand-to-hand, paradosis, it's going to be really important when we get to apostolic succession. And I know you want to jump into the the next part of of what's there, but I I just wanted to throw that in. No, great. Yeah, and I'm going to jump into that, but I want to say just one thing. When you talk about paradosis, you talk about hand-to-hand, lest anyone listening get the idea that what you're describing is like the telephone game, you know, like one right. person, another person, another person. I just want to emphasize that what 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 we're talking about is Paul goes to the city of Ephesus and he lives there and he teaches them, we learn in Acts chapter 20, night and day with tears for for about right. three years. So the point is, it's not a matter that he handed it secretly to one who handed it secretly right. to another and handed it secretly. My point is that the church of Ephesus would have known the apostle Paul's doctrine. Right. And therefore, when a letter comes to them later on, they would have actually read that letter in the light of what they knew. Tradition is the doctrine, the faith, the teaching of the apostles as it is preserved in the churches they founded, preserved in the doctrine, the life of the churches. Okay, but to the next section. Paragraph 858, this is on the apostles' mission, and I'm going to read it all, but I can be very quick with this because we we all understand that the what the apostles' mission was from the Lord, and we all pretty much agree on that. Paragraph 858, Jesus is the Father's emissary, which is a beautiful way of putting it. Here's where it all begins. The Father sends the Son. Okay, but then continuing on. From the beginning of his ministry, that is Jesus' ministry, he called he called to him those whom he desired, and he appointed twelve, whom he also named apostles, to be with him and to be sent out to preach. From then on, they would also be his emissaries, Greek apostoloi. In them, Christ continues his own mission, as the Father has sent me, Even so, I send you, Jesus said to these apostles. The apostles' ministry is the continuation of his mission. Jesus said to the twelve, he who receives you receives me. Paragraph 859, Jesus unites them, that is the apostles, to the mission he received from the Father. As the Son can do nothing of his own accord, Jesus said, but receives everything from the Father who sent him, so those whom Jesus sends can do nothing apart from him, from whom they received both the mandate of their mission and the power to carry it out. Wow, the mandate and the power. Christ's apostles knew that they were called by God as ministers of a new covenant, servants of God, ambassadors for Christ, servants of Christ, and stewards of the mysteries of God. You guys, these paragraphs in the Catechism are too rich. And if we do another series like this where we're reading through the catechism and discussing it, we're going to have to take smaller bites because I it, 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 it kind of pains me. It's like a pain in my soul to read a paragraph that rich and, and not be able to go off on all the things that it's saying. Okay. But this is the beginning really of our understanding of the church as being in a profound sense, the extension of of the incarnation into the world because Jesus is the emissary of the father. And again, I love that description. The apostles are emissaries of Christ. And I think here about what, where St. Paul said in second Corinthians chapter five. So we are ambassadors for Christ. God, God making his appeal through us, the father, the son, the apostles, we beseech you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. And so the question naturally arises, what about the church? What about the church founded on the apostles? 
And I just want to make one more comment. I'm really going to pass on. I'm not going to say much more about this because there's just too much to say, and we'll be coming back to it in the in the paragraphs to follow. But I know you feel the same way, but I love the way the Acts of the Apostles begins. Luke writes, in the first book, O Theophilus, referring to his gospel, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up after he had given commandment through the Holy Spirit to the apostles. Luke's gospel dealt with all that Jesus began both to do and to teach. And what's the implication of that? The implication is this Acts of the Apostles that I'm writing now, volume two, if you like, which is the story of the church, the apostles' ministry and the church, is going to deal with all that Jesus continued to do and to teach after he was taken up and had, through the Holy Spirit, given commandment to the apostles. The church is the emissary of the apostles, if you will, who are the emissaries of the Son, who is the emissary of the Father. And then one more paragraph here, paragraph 860. In the office of the apostles, there is one aspect that cannot be transmitted to the church, and that is to be the chosen witnesses of the Lord's resurrection, and so the foundation stones of the church. This is one aspect of the apostles' life and ministry that cannot be replicated. To be apostles, they had to be eyewitnesses of Christ's life and his ministry in order to form the foundation stones of the church. But, and here's an important paragraph, the office also has a permanent aspect, that is the office of the apostles. Christ promised to remain with them always, promised the apostles. The divine mission entrusted by Jesus to them will continue to the end of time, since the gospel they handed on is the lasting source of all life for the church. Therefore, the apostles took care to appoint successors. And now, Kenny, as you said earlier, I could have agreed when I was a Baptist pastor, I, I could have agreed with virtually everything these paragraphs about the apostles say, except for this last part. I mean, this is where a critical divide takes place between Catholic teaching and I, I'd say most non-Catholic forms of Christianity. I say most because Eastern Orthodox believe in apostolic consent, uh, succession. The Oriental, the Oriental churches do as well. But this is where the divide is. I would have said, oh, I agree with all this lovely stuff about Jesus being the emissary of the Father and the apostles the emissary of Jesus. But no, not this part about them taking care to appoint successors, which is the next section. So you know, you guys, Matt, Kenny, if you have some comments you want to make on, on this, go ahead, and then we'll hand it over to Kenny to take it forward. Yeah, so I'm just going to skip over the 500 other thoughts that I have as this is going on. <laughs> Even just the idea of ministers of a new covenant, like what does that mean? When does that happens at the Last Supper when Jesus says, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Mm -hmm. what, is, what are we supposed to do with it? Well, you got to eat it and drink it. Um, but that's a that's another aspect of, of this priesthood, right? Right. But we're talking really kind of like this apostolic succession. Um, and I guess I could have like just a couple quick stories about how differently this sounds and seems and well, really how differently it feels mm -hmm. than some of the the situations that I remember, you know, growing up, we had a, we had a past, we, well, there were a few different situations um, in my world. And I've also talked to some friends of mine. I remember specifically a friend of mine who was attending a very large church um, in the Northeast that was run by a very well-loved and uh, a man with a lot of charisma, intelligence, holiness, a clear pastoral leader, and he mm -hmm. was approaching retirement. And this multi-thousand person church was saying, we got to start, you know, a couple of years before we know he's going to retire, really getting into this, a search committee. We got to like find this person who's going to replace him because if we don't get the right person in, uh, our church is going to fail. Um, people are just going to go somewhere else. And uh, even just locally, uh, there was a pastoral shift in a sort of mega church, kind of non-denominational, you know, rock and roll Sunday morning situation where their pastor moved on as a founding pastor. 
And I am on their email list because I'm curious about such things. And they would repeatedly say, hey, we're bringing in so-and-so. He'll be preaching the such-and-such Sunday sermon, and then you can meet with him afterwards. It, they were doing like American Idol auditions <laughs> for the next pastor um, because it's, yeah. it was going to be their first time really going through this transition from the founder to the next mm-hmm. person. Um, the idea of the apostles taking care to appoint their successors it doesn't feel to me that it, that the early church is saying to themselves, we got to find somebody who's as dynamic as Peter or this gospel is going to fail, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Or that we're gonna, we got to find somebody who's got the apostolic zeal and missionary initiative of Paul or this gospel is going to fail. Um, Paul's going town to town and laying on hands, right? <laughs> and like these people are going town to town and laying on hands. And they're laying hands on people from whom we have almost like no writings whatsoever, most of them, right? Um, Something else is being transmitted through this apostolic line besides just charisma and public speaking ability and teaching skill or administrative acumen. There's something that's going on here that transcends all of that. And having been part of pastoral transitions in my own life, having heard so many of my friends talk about these things, I mean, and we, at the Coming Home Network, we talk to all kinds of pastors who are becoming Catholic, we talk about kinds of aspects of of what they deal with. One of the things that we don't talk about as much publicly is the angst that a lot of them go through thinking to themselves, if I leave my church, who's going to come in behind me and teach the people that I was teaching, you know, that I was caring for? Um, These are crises that exist in the world of non-apostolic succession. And we got, make no mistake, we got plenty of leadership problems and administrative and scandal, all kinds of stuff in in the Catholic church, but there's something that's being passed on that is substantial, that has protected this thing full of human error. So. Yeah, it's true. And if you're, if you're honest and well, (laughs) let me be careful how I say that. If you will take uh, these ideas with you as you read scripture and give them a fair, let them be a lens and give the New Testament a fair reading through this lens, you'll see that, that for instance, Paul especially is laying hands on people and talking about the laying on of hands to those people as the basis for their authority and telling them to be careful about how they do that and to do it in perpetuity, uh, in perpetuity to keep doing it. So he says to to, to Timothy, uh, look, I appointed you to serve the church in Ephesus. And I told you that this is how you're supposed to do it. And remember to fan into flame the gift that the Holy Spirit gave you through the laying on of my hands and the hands of the presbytery. He tells Titus, I left you in Crete. I did it. You're my delegate. You're my successor in order that you should set in order the things that remain. And then he tells him that one of the things that remains to be set in order is paradosis, to find other bishops and lay hands on them and entrust them uh, with the teaching of the church. Interestingly, in neither of those letters does Paul say something like, be sure you write everything down. (laughs) Mm-hmm. Write it all down. Hurry, hurry. Yeah. Make sure you're constantly writing, constantly writing. And in fact, if writing everything down was embedded in the apostolic mind, then nine of the guys that Jesus chose are utter failures. Andrew, James, Philip, Bartholomew, Thomas, Thaddeus, Math- and Matthias never wrote anything down that we can find. Like this is not their impulse to write anything down. Then you have Matthew, John, and Peter who write, and then Paul who writes the most uh, in terms of the distribution of his letters. And then you have guys that aren't apostles writing, Mark, Luke, James, Jude, and the anonymous writer of Hebrews. So the impulse of writing everything down in order to have apostolicity keep going forward doesn't seem like the impulse of the church. What seems like the impulse is what you're saying here, Ken and Matt that you find the right guys, you lay hands on them, you impart truth to them, you put it in their hands through the laying on of your hands, as it were, and you hold them and their listeners accountable for that truth. Now, eventually in history, 
Scripture comes up out of that, bubbles up out of that through the life of the church. But not all of these guys aren't doing that. They're not prolific writers. They're, they are rather apostolic teachers. Uh, I'll pause there because there's more to say uh, in, the, in the next section. Yeah, so what you're saying is that the impulse of the apostles is not to go to new towns and start a newspaper. It's right. to go to new towns and start a church. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's a good uh, that's a good pithy little way to put it. <laughs> and of course, it, as you were talking about Timothy and you were talking about Titus, Kenny, I couldn't help but think about 2 Timothy 1, 13 and 14 and 2, you know, where, where, because this is a passage that blew my mind myself, Paul says to Timothy, here he is about to leave this world. He appears to believe that he's on his last leg, as it were, and he writes to Timothy, and instead of saying, write, 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 like you said, or, or, or get thee down to, you know, Office Depot, which I guess has gone bankrupt, maybe doesn't even exist anymore, get down to some place where you can make a ton of copies of the letters I've written and what else? whatever other apostolic yep. letters we have at hand. Instead of yeah. saying that, he says, he says to Timothy, here are my final words. Follow this pattern of sound words, the which you have heard, which, which you've heard from me in yeah. faith and love. And then he says, guard the truth that has been entrusted to you by the Holy Spirit who dwells in you. You're right. going to guard it by the Holy Spirit who dwells in you, not by writing it down, not by, you know, not by making copies. And then you, my son, be strong in the grace and what you have heard from me and trust to faithful men. And I, I'll, I'll simply say this. It became clear to me at a certain point, you guys, that Paul believed somehow that the substance of his doctrine would and could be preserved by the Holy Spirit through his successors, through the laying on of hands, through the transmission of authority. He believed that. He mm -hmm. believed that this is how his doctrine would be preserved and handed down, which I think moves you pretty com comfortably into the next paragraphs, right? Yeah, but before I do, Matt, any, anything <laughs> okay. else there? I want to make, make sure. I can't say head. anything or I'll just start going. <laughs> okay. just, this is really, okay. really rich stuff. And it's Good. so very different than how we all experienced it. And, you know, totally. as a Baptist, well, you as a Pentecostal, well, you, me as a Wesleyan. You said you had 500 points and you, you only <laughs> gave one. So, I mean, you you can give at least 37 more. Uh, uh, at least do no, one. No, at least do no, one. No, no. That's for our yeah, Patreon okay. subscribers uh, yeah. when we start our <laughs> Patreon account. Uh, no, what, no. Once we start it. Once we start okay. it. Well, let's do this. Let's we can talk more. And Matt, say if if something pops during the next two paragraphs, bring it out. But I I want to spend some time um, doing some on the journey dialogue with these next two paragraphs. I'm tell uh, share some anecdotes from my own life here. But let me let me read paragraph eight sixty one, and then I want to share a few quotes from Pope Benedict of the sixteenth that we can interact with. Then we'll read eight sixty two, and then I'll hand it. Back over to Ken after sharing a little bit there. So here's paragraph 861. Now we're getting to the nitty gritty of the, the guys, the successors. So we have the apostolic now, you know, embodied in, in actual people. So here we go, 861. In order that the mission entrusted to them might be continued after their death, the apostles consigned by will and testament, as it were, to their immediate collaborators the duty of completing and consolidating the work they had begun, urging them to tend to the whole flock in which the Holy Spirit had appointed them to shepherd the church of God. There, uh, the catechism is referencing Paul's exhortation to the elders in the church of Ephesus in the book of Acts. And interestingly, just before I go on, it's the Holy Spirit who made them overseers. How so? By the laying on of the hands of the apostles. There's no either or, it's the both and of our ecclesiology here. So then finally it says, they accordingly designated such men and then made the ruling that likewise on their death, other proven men <clears throat> should take over the ministry. Now, before I read the quotes from Pope Benedict, let me just say, that what's happening there in that last, last sentence is basically what's happening in the early earliest church documents. You can see very shortly after um, all of this has taken place, Jesus has founded the church, the church is growing, that in the church of Corinth, 
the let's call it you know uh, I'll, I'll be a little loosey goosey here but let's call it the heresy of congregationalism tries to rear its ugly head mm. and and the christians in corinth think that they can kick out the apostolic successors that were appointed by successors of the apostles and put their own guys in charge and so mm -hmm. saint clement of rome if you've never read his letter those who are watching go look it up saint clement of rome and his uh, letter to the Corinthians, he corrects them on this exact point. He says, it's not for you to choose your own leaders. That is for the, the apostles and their successors to do through what he calls the episcopate. And that this would be a point of contention that Jesus and the apostles knew would happen in the church. And so, you know, talk about tradition. You could, you can see this fact of reality, the embodied reality of this in the writings of some of the earliest Christians that they, it is not apostolic for a congregation to do like what Matt said, uh, um, you know, um, star search for their, for their next pastor. <laughs> so, you know, uh, they, the apostles and their successors designate who succeeds them. Now I want to read a couple of quotes from some of the audiences. These, th these would be small little sermons from Pope Benedict the 16th. These were all given uh, over the course of weeks in April and May of 2006. So imagine uh, Pope Benedict XVI sitting either in St. Peter's Square or in the um, auditorium there, you know, at, at the Vatican, and he's teaching on what tradition is. And I'm going to read some quotes to you, and then you can interact with them. Here are three sets of quotes from Pope Benedict on this notion of tradition, the apostles, and succession. First is on April 26, 2006. Sixth, he says this, The church's apostolic tradition consists in transmission of the goods of salvation, which, through the power of the Spirit, makes the Christian community the permanent actualization of the original communion. That's a way of saying the church that's still here today and the successors of the apostle, the apostles are the embodied reality of the earliest ministry of the church. Then he goes on and says, it is called original because it was born of the witness of the apostles and of the community of the disciples at the time of its origins. It was passed on under the guidance of the Holy Spirit in the New Testament writings. And as you said, Ken, here it is, and in the sacramental life, in the life of faith, and the church continuously refers to it, to this tradition, which is the whole, ever up-to-date reality of Jesus' gift as her foundation and law through the uninterrupted succession of the apostolic ministry. That's a way of saying it's not just something in the past. It's a past reality that remains ever-present, contemporaneous to the people of God, in every generation through people. Two more ideas here. He, he says then uh, on the 3rd of May, 2006, he says this. This is so helpful. Tradition, says Pope Benedict, is not a collection of things or words like a box of dead things. Tradition is the river of new life that flows from the origins from Christ down to us and makes us participate in God's history with humanity. See how he doesn't want to separate tradition from people and make it sayings on a piece of paper or cassette tapes or, you know, anything. He's, he's saying it's in history with humanity. It comes through the embodied church. Then he says, tradition is the living gospel proclaimed by the apostles in its integrity on the basis of the fullness of their unique, unrepeatable experience. And then I'll just read one more and we can we can tear it up here. This is on May 10th, 2006. He says, tradition. Now this is, this is the exclamation mark. What is tradition, Pope Benedict the 16th? I'm so glad you asked. Tradition is the permanent presence of the word and life of Jesus among his people. But in order to be present, the word needs a person as witness or a witness succession in the role of bishop is presented as the con as the continuity of the apostolic ministry a guarantee of the permanence of apostolic tradition 
word, and life entrusted to us by the Lord, the link between the College of Bishops and the community of the original apostles is understood to have this line of historical continuity. And I'll stop there for you guys oh, to whoa, interact whoa, whoa. with that in any way you'd like to. Anything There's a problem once that? you open the Ratzinger box. Uh, yeah, <laughs> <Here we so>, go. <laughs> yeah, I know. There's It's loaded, man. It is loaded. Uh, okay, so just back to that, that very first quote of yours, um, the idea of this being, you know, uh, a, a living organ, like we're the same church now that we were then. Exactly. Different members, same church, right? Same mm-hmm. church now as we were back then. And it, it, this were this is where our whole concept, and we've we've talked about this over and over, um, uh, especially a few episodes ago. The idea of a body ecclesiology mm-hmm. is so important that that this is the image that is given to us, and it's given to the church before the church knows anything about, like, anything even remotely close to what we understand about medicine and physiology now right so let me ask you this do you guys still have the same soul you had 15 years ago i would i would hope so if not i'm going to have to call like an exorcist or something (laughs) we have the same soul we were born with but the the human body replaces every single cell inside of itself at over the course of about a seven to ten year period right so all the actual physical aspects of your body have replaced themselves at some point in the last decade mm-hmm. completely, mm-hmm. but the mm-hmm. soul has remained right. Mm-hmm. These bishops have died and gotten replaced at various points. Some of them were bishops for a long time. Some of them were, you know, martyred within days of becoming bishops, but it's the same body. The same body has been here the whole time replacing a cell here and there the soul being continuous through the whole thing it just it just that first quote especially just drives home to me how important it is that the image of the body is given to us as this image of to help us understand what the church really is this this whole subject here and the paragraphs that you're reading Kenny and from the catechism and then from uh, from cardinal, cardinal at the time Ratzinger, no pope benedict the 16th pope at, the at the time, time yeah yeah uh, when you open the Ratzinger box, <laughs> what this is, uh, you know, I got 500 things too. I'm just trying to, trying to uh, get it all down into one thing. Send someone but, to fetch us. We're in Saskatchewan. <laughs> <laughs> this is what's coming to me. You guys is, is when I was a Baptist and for many Protestants, the church is what's described in the new Testament and what we do is we just keep trying to hit the reset button. We keep trying to go back and just imitate what we see there. And there is no trust in the in the idea of the Holy Spirit being in the church and leading the church. You know, um, I, I don't want to say it in a wrong way, but there's something going on there. And that is that what Paul said to Timothy about guarding the deposit of faith he had given to Timothy by the Holy Spirit um, this come this comes into play in a big way, and that is the Catholic Church has a strong sense of the Holy Spirit's having led in the development of the Church's hierarchy, mm-hmm. and the, this thing you're talking about, apostolic succession, because in a way, I mean, to a certain extent, it, I, I'm referring to you now, Kenny. You know, the new the the biblical theologian guy. To a certain extent, I'm in agreement with New Testament scholars who would insist that during the time of the apostles, the terms presbyteros and episcopoi are kind of used interchangeably some. Uh, But when the apostles die, then a differentiation begins to take place where those whom they appoint to be their successors are taking the title of bishop, episcopos, and and the priests, those under them are are the the presbyteros, the presbyters, okay, you're under them. And there is kind of a development that takes place. And we see this by the time we read St. Ignatius of Antioch's wonderful letters. As he describes the church, there's a bishop in every city, in every church, and under the bishop are the priests and the deacons. Now, as a Protestant, or I'll put it as a Baptist, I would have viewed this as a simple departure from the truth. You know, to get to the truth, you got to p- press the reset button and you got to read what you see in the pastoral epistles and you don't go any further. This is a departure from the truth. 
But now I, I, I see it very differently. I see it as, ah, the Holy Spirit was leading the church after the death of the apostles. This is the result of the leading of the Spirit in the church. And this fits so well with those paragraphs that you read. And I want to read you just one paragraph from Father Francis Sullivan, who taught ecclesiology at the, the Gregorian in Rome for many years. Um, in his book, Magisterium, Teaching Authority in the Catholic Church, this is what he says about this subject. If the dating generally accepted for the letters of Ignatius of Antioch is correct, that is very early, 110 AD, 117 AD at the latest, then before all the books of the canonical New Testament were even written, the threefold hierarchy of one bishop, a college of presbyters, elders, and a number of deacons was already established in Syria and parts of Asia Minor at least. By the third quarter of the second century, every church that we have information about with the exception of Alexandria, had a single bishop ruling it. On the basis of the following facts, and here's the crucial thing that I want to communicate, on the basis of the following facts, that this development took place within so short a time, within the whole church, without any resistance on the part of presbyters or people, and that these bishops were accepted as legitimate successors of the apostles, the conclusion is drawn that this development must have been guided by the Holy Spirit and must have been part of God's design for the church. I, I just want to throw it back to you, so Kenny, because this just so fits good. exactly with what you're reading to us. Yeah, I, I want to read the next paragraph and we can we can unpack more, but I just was mm -hmm. struck as as you were both sharing about the you know the again the reflex the protestant reflex that if you see a development it means a departure <laughs> which is yes, again yes. for forgetting that the church is this living organism this embodied um personal human mm -hmm. and divine reality and it'd be, it'd be like somebody seeing a picture of me when i was seven days old and then seeing a video of me walking you know as a two-year-old and saying oh he's departed from his original <laughs> person pristine for me uh, like he he yeah. what a departure and then seeing me now with a beard and say boy did he really depart he really depart yeah. I'm like no uh, no yeah. this is what organisms do they grow into themselves and they grow into the themselves and they they yeah, find yeah. ways to administrate their situations you show me where in the pages of the book of acts the office of music minister is established yeah. you show me where in the pages of the book of acts the office of youth minister is or or children's church director. Yeah. <laughs> Where are yeah. these offices in the scriptures? But right. and yet you guys would have known that you would have had to have some kinds of mechanisms in your church where you under your authority as pastor would have to oversee those roles and appoint people for those positions. And yet totally. um the idea of that happening in the early church can seem like this offensive uh departure, yeah. which is wild. Yeah. Right. And there can be there can be bad developments and there can be good developments, but the point is we, we have a strong sense of the Holy Spirit's presence in the church to develop the church. So right. yeah, you, you, don't, you don't look like you did when you were a baby and all that. And when I'm laying around completely senile and drooling out of both sides of my mouth, then you can say, hey, Ken hit the reset bu button. Now he's back to what he was as an infant. This is great. <laughs> this is great. <laughs> okay. Go ahead, Kenny. Go There's ahead. so much we can say. I, I'm going to read this next paragraph and then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just share an anecdote from, from my own life. And I know this episode will be a little longer, but please, please bear with us. So here we are at 862. This is important stuff as we put the capstone on these four marks of the church. Here's 862. Just as the office which the Lord confided to Peter alone as first of the apostles, destined to be transmitted to his successors, is a permanent one, so also endures the office which the apostles received of shepherding the church, a charge destined to be exercised without interruption by the sacred order of bishops. Hence, the church teaches that, quote, the bishops have by divine institution taken the place of the apostles as pastors of the church in such wise that whoever listens to them is listening to Christ. And whoever despises them despises Christ and him who 
sent Christ, close quote. Now, we've been talking about how the apostles chose successors and that this goes on throughout the entire history of the church. And this is a, a clear cut facet of what we mean when we say that the church is apostolic. Now, I've shared a little bit in a previous episode about my ordination because I, after a few years of pastoring in the Foursquare Church, completed all of the time and educational and tenure related uh, requirements to receive an international ordination by my denomination. And what happened to me, I think, is indicative of what you see in much of North American Christianity, which is that the notion of apostolicity has been swapped out for something more like entrepreneurialism and and imitation and emulation. So if you can find a guy or a group of guys that want to start something and they try to make it look as much like the Bible as they think it does, then somehow that that by virtue of doing what they think the Bible is teaching, they then are participants in apostolic authority. We say, Kenny, really? Do people do that? Yeah, I was part of a denomination where that actually happened. In the mid-1910s and 20s, a female evangelist named Amy Semple McPherson started going around the country doing tent revivals. And in 1922, she developed her basic theological matrix for understanding the gospel. Think of that. She, it, it's in 1922, way back then, you know, 101 year, 102 years ago. A year later, after she develops this theological matrix, she starts a church in Los Angeles. And then one year later, another church is started in Los Angeles. And then two years after that second church uh, in Long Beach, two years after that, she thinks, I'll start a Bible college because I've got all these people that want to be ministers in my kind of Christianity. So I will start a church. I will start a denomination. I will start a Bible college. And in that Bible college, I will teach and we will teach the Bible <laughs> we, the way we think it should be understood. And we'll take to ourselves, by virtue of doing mm -hmm. these things, the authority to ordain people. And mm -hmm. so then they start this Bible school. Well, in 1927, they have a hundred of these four square gospel churches with or ordinations that they gave out. So what did they do? Well, they headed over to the IRS and incorporated themselves as a denomination. And so a hundred years later, that approach has garnered 8.8 .8 million adherents, a hundred thousand uh, um, ministers and churches in 150 different countries. How is that apostolic? And this is a question that I really wrestled with on the day of my ordination a few years before I quit pastoring as I'm standing there. And again, guys, I'm thinking about all this history that I was wow. familiar with in my own denomination, but having also been in seminary and, and, and looking at what the early church was doing, and I came to a crisis point at this time in my, at my own ordination. It's one of the watershed moments where I have hands mm -hmm. being laid on me. And I'm asking myself, who gave these people authority to lay hands on me and call me a minister of the gospel? Like, are they really apostolic? And what I came to is that to the degree in which we felt that we were doing what the Bible was teaching, we would think of ourselves as apostolic. But in reality, okay, let me make it personal and then I'll stop talking. If Kenny Burchard in the year 2024 felt that God called him to go out and start his own denomination and his own church and his own Bible school and take to himself mm. the authority to lay hands on everybody and ordain them to ministry, that's an exercise in self-ordination. <laughs> that's what it mm. is. Yeah. And that should make all of us wince at the very notion. And this is, I, I think, one of the things oh. that we hear often in our work, many pastors uh, or clergy who came into their ministry in this way, I think rightly question the propriety of that approach to calling what we're doing apostolic. I think it really is more emulation and imitation and entrepreneurialism 
than it is apostolic, which doesn't mean God's not working. He has, he is at work. But I'm just saying, I think what we've presented here today says there is a guardrail around a true biblical concept of apostolicity that many of us, frankly, lacked um, in our previous traditions. Okay, okay, there. okay, okay. When you say when you when you say the things that you just said, I thought of you know self ordination. I I thought of Napoleon placing the crown on his own head. He took the crown. He placed it on his own head. He crowned himself emperor. But but even more than that, one of my favorite movies of all time is the movie The Apostle. The great actor Robert Duvall. This, this is a movie. I mean, this is a film apparently that had been that, that had been germinating within him for years and years and years. He had a great love for Pentecostalism and Southern Pentecostalism. But in that movie. I mean, here he is. He's hit some guy with a bat and killed him, and he's on the run from the law. And he goes down into this lake, and he baptizes himself the Apostle E.F. That scene, he goes down into the water, and he says, I baptize you, the Apostle. He baptizes himself. And what you're describing here really is not far from that. For Amy Simple McPherson to dream up her own theological system, you know, to start this whole thing, yeah, I, I just think, I, I mean, I'm just saying amen. The points you're making here are really strong. Where does the authority come from for a person who happens to be on, um, you know, American Idol and, you know, rise <laughs> to the top, someone who's charismatic, someone who can talk, someone who likes people, someone who can teach, just starting a denomination, and, you know, ordaining himself and then ordaining people under him. And by the way, one more word on American Idol. It cracked me up when you said that, Matt, because when I was hired as a youth pastor, I had to go and I had to audition with the senior pastor. And he wanted me to bring my guitar along so that I could play and sing and sing and show him uh, how I can lead worship, too. Could Tina so, play the piano? Like, I mean, did you, was it was no. having a wife who could play the piano an issue in your, in your world? Because it kind of was in, no. in some of the circles I ran in. No. No, there was a there was a, a well beaten path. Asbury College was across the street from Asbury Seminary. And there was a well beaten path from the Asbury Seminary theological de uh, department to the Asbury College music department, looking for looking for wives. <laughs> so, um, anyway, good point. I I don't want to get to a fork in the road here, but I have to just ask one question, or maybe just toss one thought out here. A lot of these people who are ordained in these worlds, you guys included, the concept of what you were ordained to do is so very different than the concept of what people are ordained to do in apostolic succession. Right. If, as in the catechism, it says, Jesus ordained these men to be ministers of the new covenant, and the new covenant is in his blood, as he says at the Last Supper, that they must eat and drink. The Catholic Church understands that the function of apostolic succession is to continue to ordain people who have been given that authority by Christ to preside over the Lord's Supper. And I guarantee you that most of the people that I know who prepare for ordination in my world, and I was uh, in mostly a Wesleyan world, they did not believe that God was calling them to ministry so that they could do the Lord's Supper as their primary function. No. They believe that their primary goal was to be ministers of the word, not yeah. ministers of the sacrament. And that is where I think a key difference is here, that when we talk sure. about what it means to be apostolic, that's what the church is trying to remind us of, is that this apostolic line means that you can go to communion and you know that the priest who is presiding over the Eucharist has been validly ordained and given the authority to communicate this, no matter how good of a speaker he is, <laughs> no matter how good or bad he is at running the finance committee. He is there to be a minister of the sacrament. He is a minister yeah. of the new covenant. So I just want to make sure that that distinction is out there here at the end too. Mm -hmm. That's good. That's good. <clears throat> okay. Um, are you ready for me to bring this thing in? Do it. Landing here? Take, take us home. Okay. Take us home. No, th this is almost like a sermon because in the final few paragraphs here on the apostolate, we have really the application to ourselves of all that we've said here so far. Um, so let me read. I'm just going to read again, 863, 864, 865. The whole church is apostolic now. Okay, so 
we have the Father sending the Son, we have the Son sending the Apostles, we have the Apostles ordaining their successors, but then it's the whole church. The whole church is apostolic in that she remains through the successors of St. Peter and the other Apostles in communion of faith and life with her origin. And in that, she is sent out into the whole world, all the people of God. All members of the church share in this mission, though in various ways. The Christian vocation is of its nature a vocation to the apostolate as well. Indeed, we call an apostolate every activity of the mystical body that aims to spread the kingdom of Christ over all the earth. Anything any activity of the mystical body whose aim is to spread the kingdom of Christ over all the world is apostolic. Um, in my world, as a Protestant, we use the word ministry. We didn't use the word apostolate, but this is what we're talking about. 864, Christ sent by the Father is the source of the church's whole apostolate. Thus, the fruitfulness of apostolate for ordained ministers as well as for lay people clearly depends on their vital union with Christ. We're going to come back to that key, key passage. In keeping with their vocations, the demands of the times, and the various gifts of the Holy Spirit, the apostolate assumes the most varied forms. Again, any activity of the mystical body of Christ, but charity drawn from the Eucharist above all is always, as it were, the soul of the whole apostolate. And then 865. The church is ultimately one, holy, Catholic, and apostolic in her deepest and ultimate identity because it is in her that the kingdom of heaven, the reign of God, already exists, that you're thinking about Ratzinger here, already exists and will be fulfilled at the end of time. The kingdom has come in the person of Christ and grows mysteriously in the hearts of those incorporated into him until its full eschatological manifestation at the end of time. Then all those he has redeemed and made holy and blameless before him in love will be gathered together as the one people of God, the bride of Christ, the bride of the Lamb, the holy city Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. For the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and on them the twelve names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. Okay, in Christ, each one of us, these final passages are telling us, paragraphs, each one of us is called to the apostolate, to apostolic ministry. And the lines that strike me the most in this that I want to apply to us as we close are these, where, where the Catechism said the fruitfulness of the apostolate for ordained ministers as well as lay people clearly depends on their vital union with Christ. In other words, one cannot give what one does not have. The, the fruitfulness of what we do depends on our vital union with Christ. And, and then this, in keeping with their vocations, the demands of the times, the various gifts of the Spirit, the apostolate assumes the most varied forms. Now, this was essentially the entire message of St. Jose Maria Escriva, the founder of Opus Dei. Uh, first was the universal call to holiness, being united to Christ. If there's to be any fruitfulness, you cannot give what, what you do not have. And then second, this universal call to apostolate in keeping with the vocation that each one of us has been given, the situation we find ourselves in in life, the, the unique gifts that we have been endowed with by the Holy Spirit, each of us, according to this, is called to be an emissary of Christ. And the point I want to make to those maybe who feel like, oh, I'm not in ministry, I don't preach, I don't teach, I don't lead anything, is I want to emphasize that this is something very natural. It, it, if you're united to Jesus, it's simply who you are in all of the situations in which you find yourself. That is a, your apostolate, being who you are, bringing what you know, what you believe, what you have into all of the situations in which you find yourself. To use myself as an example, okay, during the day, my apostolate is here at the Coming Home Network. I teach, I answer questions, I try to be a friend to Protestant ministers scattered all over the world from every conceivable denomination who have found themselves on a path, on a journey 
in the direction of the Catholic Church. That's my apostolate during the day. And when I leave here, my apostolate involves playing catch with my grandkids. I have the apostolate of playing catch. I'm involved in the apostolate of chauffeuring grandkids back and forth to basketball practice, to home, to whatever they need to be doing. I'm involved in the apostolate of teaching guitar lessons to several of my, to two of my grandchildren. I'm involved in the apostolate of being a chauffeur. I'm involved in the apostolate of talking, the apostolate of just hanging out, sometimes the apostolate of watching a movie, of eating together. In every situation, I'm an emissary. And the same is true of you guys. Here's something that St. Jose Maria said about this in his classic work, The Way. And I'm going to finish with this and throw it to you, Matt and Kenny, for any final words that you might have. This is what he said. Point 301 of The Way. A secret, an open secret. These world crises that we're facing are crises of saints. God wants a handful of men and women of his own in every human activity. And then Pax Christi in Regno Christi, the peace of Christ in the kingdom of Christ. And this is such a beautiful theme in this last, these last paragraphs here on the Apostolate and in the work of St. Jose Maria. It's such a beautiful theme because it's so encouraging. I mean, your job can be standing behind the counter at Taco Bell and in that situation, you are called to be Christ's emissary in whatever ways you can, according to the gifts you've been given. You could be giving out the shoes at, at the bowling alley and spraying them after a bowler brings them back to you. And you're an emissary there. And you too, Kenny, in your life, you too, Matt, in your lives. And I just, I'll just close with that. And if you have anything you want to say, you can add this and then we'll have, have Matt bring it in for closing. Yeah. Um, we can kick it to Matt to bring us home. I, I think of um, as we've gone through this whole series on the church, and especially today, my my heart and mind is driven back to that which we all do together most often, and that is to celebrate the Mass, the liturgy together. And I think of that as the time, the time par excellence, the, the time, the, the crescendo of what all this means when we as the scattered humanity are gathered up together by the <laughs> call of Jesus into one with our Lord and through the succession of the apostles, through the ever present ministry that's been given to them through the ages, we're caught back up into all of that again. And we worship and we mm -hmm. celebrate. And then at the end of it all, when it's all done and the final prayer is prayed. We hear the voice of a deacon or we hear the voice of a priest saying to us what you just said, Ken, at the end here of the reading of the section of the catechism in simple terms that go something like this. Go forth glorifying God by your lives or go forth the mass has ended or go forth and preach the gospel to every nation. In that, we pick up this apostolic call and this apostolic impulse to go fed by Christ, filled by Christ, out into the world to do what we're called to do in our own unique mm -hmm. sphere of influence. But always in, and this is the terms that we use as Catholics, always in full communion with Jesus and the church that he founded and the apostles and their successors all the way down to the present age. That's what we mean when we say the church is apostolic. And I'll just stop right there. Well, you left out one iteration of that uh, <laughs> that particular ending. Go, lat go Latin on us, man. I'll go, go Latin on you. Uh, if you're going to, to Mass in Latin, you're not going to hear go forth in peace to announce the gospel. You're going to hear ite misa est, which means go forth, it is sent. And that word misa is the word from which we get the mass. word mass. It's weird that we call our gathering ascending, <laughs> right? Yes. Mm -hmm. But that's that's what we mean by being apostolic, right? Uh, the apostles were sent. We, as the body of Christ in the world, are sent. So, anything else before I shut it down? So good. Oh. So good. 
Uh, just right. that well, I have really loved the series, guys, on the church. Oh, I'm man, so it's been glad. so fun. It's been so, so fun. Well, we am, is, R and B. They whom are known as Matt, Ken, and Kenny. Uh, we've been doing this series on the church, wrapped it up today. If you want to go back and start at the very beginning, I believe it starts at episode 128. Um, so you can catch the very beginning of the series uh, moving forward. Our next series, I believe we're going to get to walk through. We've gotten glimpses into Kenny's story. But I think we're going to get to see kind of like the fuller picture of how it all fits together. So looking forward to that. In the meantime, check out all previous episodes of On the Journey at the Coming Home Network website. That's chnetwork.org. If you're... Uh, wanting to work through these questions and need a community to do it in, uh, we have an online community. Uh, it's free to join, and it's full of some awesome people. That's community.chnetwork.org. And again, all these things are made possible uh, through the generous support of our partners in mission. And if you want to uh, consider making either a one-time or a monthly gift to help us to keep doing this kind of work, then please do go to chnetwork.org slash donate. Gentlemen, thank you as always. Have a great day. Thank you. Good day. Talk to you later.